All right. If I could, I'd just like to get myself on video. That way, review it. We could always improve in every area. Um, There's only one established church Jesus promised to build. And I'd like to go over today the subject of, what's that? I got you out of mind. <laughs> I'd like to go over the subject of the church of the New Testament and also salvation. So I got book, chapter, and verse for everything I'm going over. So y'all could study for yourselves and go home. It's a good study guide. You're having a Bible study with somebody. This is something great to go over. Uh, so the, the topic of the first part, the church of the New Testament. Now notice it says church, there's only one. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said this, he's saying it to Peter. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, in the singular. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, in the singular. Colossians 1, 18, we notice the church already has another different name. And he is the head of the body. The church, so the church is also known as the body, and it just so go along, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So we notice that the church is also called the body, and again, the body in the singular. Uh, Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So we see that there's only one church, there's only one body, and it says Christ is the savior of this body. So if we're not a member of this church, this body, there is no salvation because Jesus is the savior of the body. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body. We know the church is also called the body. So when it says there is one body, that means there is only one church. Now, the church of the New Testament, I'm going to ask three questions and I'll go through it. Number one, who built it? Number two, where was it built? And number three, when was it built? So we understand that Jesus built the church, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said to Peter, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we know that Jesus promised to build his church. So the church of the New Testament, Jesus established and built it. Where, where was it built? We see in Acts chapter 2, the church is established, and it was in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So again, when was it built? Well, it was built on the day of Pentecost during the first century, when all the Jews gathered together, uh, and it was established on the day of Pentecost. That's where we read about individuals being added to the church. Um, so Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18, that nothing would prevail against his church, not even the gates of Hades. Either Jesus was lying and the first century church is not in existence today, or he was telling the truth. And through thorough study and search, we can still find that church today. Jesus promised it never be destroyed. It'd be an everlasting kingdom. So either he was telling the truth. If you plant an apple seed 2,000 years ago, it's going to create an apple tree. If you plant an apple seed today, it's going to make an apple tree. You plant an apple seed 2,000 years in the future, it's going to make an apple tree. <clears throat> so if Jesus established his church 2,000 years ago, we should be able to find it today. And if 2,000 years in the future, mankind is still here, we should be able to find it then as well. Um, okay, the only way to be added to this church is by doing what God has commanded, just as we see those in the first century doing throughout the New Testament, beginning in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is when the church was established, and notice Acts 2, verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, compare that with Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we know individuals who were baptized were added. Well, if we look at verse 247, chapter 2, verse 47 of Acts, it says that the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. So we know those who were being baptized were saved, and then they were then added to the church. 
Well, who added them? It says right here, the Lord added them to his church. Uh, okay, anybody, so this is the only way we find individuals in the New Testament being added to the church which Christ established. There is no other method. You'll find no other way of anybody being added to the church except like this. So, um, anybody claiming they are a member of the church which Christ established by another method than this is a liar and will suffer eternal punishment on the day of judgment for not obeying the gospel. And we know that because if they're not a member of the body, Jesus is the savior of the body, well, they're not saved. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So, I mean, we got to obey the gospel. Many make the claim that baptism is an outward show of an inward grace. But let us look to God's word to see what baptism is really for. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see baptism is for the remission of sins. But this is the thing. A lot of people will say, oh yeah, I agree, baptism is for the remission of sins. But many will say that for means because of. That they were baptized because they had already been forgiven. And this is a common practice throughout all denominations. They baptize for the remission of sins, but they baptize because they say they claim they've already been forgiven. Now, what we're going to look at is the word for. Uh, the Greek word for is eis, E-I-S. And it, it is always looking forward and never backwards. So individuals claiming they were baptized for the remission of sins, meaning because they were already forgiven. Let's take a look at Matthew 26, 28, because it also says Jesus' blood was shed for the remission of sins. Same Greek word. And it's not looking backwards, it's looking forwards. So did Jesus die because many were already forgiven? No. He died in order that they would receive forgiveness. In the same way we are baptized for, meaning in order to receive the remission of sins. Do you go to a store for a soda because you already have a soda or in order to get a soda? In order to get baptism is for or in order to receive the remission of sins. Now, let's forget what man says for a moment and let us look to see what God has to say. First, notice all the things which are found in Christ. And if y'all turn to the next page, has a list of the things which are in Christ. Salvation, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So we know that salvation is in Christ. Eternal life, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us. Eternal life, and this life is where? In his son. Eternal life is in Christ. Now Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where? In Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now let us notice Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? In Christ. So this is the thing. This is just four out of many things which are in Christ. Salvation is in Christ, meaning there's no salvation outside of Christ. Eternal life is in Christ, meaning there's no eternal life outside of Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ, so if you're not in Christ, you're condemned. Why? Because you did not believe on the Son of God. And in 1 John it says, if we do not believe the record that God has given to His Son, we make God a liar. And the Bible says all, lake, all liars will be thrown into the lake of fire. Um, Okay, and all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. This would mean if all blessings are in Christ, well, how many are out of Christ? No spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. So the question is then, how does one get in Christ where all these wonderful things are found? Now, the scripture shows twice how one gets into Christ, and it is by the same method both times. You will find no other way of an individual getting into Christ except by this method. Uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 3 Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death Galatians 3 27 again the same method two different verses you'll not find it anywhere else Galatians 3 27 for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ now this is the thing if you're in a room 
and you're already in the room, can you get in the room a second time? Like, I'm in this room now, okay, I'm going to go in this room. That doesn't make sense because I'm already here. Either you're baptized into Christ, but individuals claim, oh, they're already in Christ, so then they get baptized, but that's not what the Bible says. How can you go in somewhere you're already in? Either you're baptized into Christ, or you're not. Uh, the point is this, Christ is the Savior of only His church, uh, Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We know the church is the body. Jesus is only the Savior of the body. How many bodies? One. It gives one head, one body. Um, the point also is this, baptism is the point at which an individual is added to the church, Acts 2.41 and 2.47. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we understand that only individuals who are baptized are added to this church. It's the only method you can find of an individual being added to the church which Christ has established. Um, the next question is this, which baptism is it speaking of? Because the Bible, the New Testament, does speak of multiple baptisms, but by the time Ephesians 4 or 5 was written to the church at Ephesus, there is only one baptism which all believers share in common. Check out Ephesians 4 verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 easily tell us which baptism this is. Uh, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was in preparing where a few that is eight souls were saved by water. The like figure were unto even baptism. What baptism? Water baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let us look through the six baptisms mentioned in scripture in the New Testament to narrow down which one it is still in effect today, which every Christian must have. Otherwise, they are no Christian at all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. In order to have the one Lord, you must have the one faith. In order to have the one faith, you must have the one baptism. Now, I'm going to go through, I've printed a list of six different baptisms, um, and we're going to narrow down through the means of elimination which baptism it is today, which is still relevant, which we must have to be in the body of Christ. Um, okay, through the means of elimination, we will determine which baptism it is, which adds an individual to the church Christ established, Acts 2.41 and Acts 2.47, in order that they can be saved, Ephesians 5.23, because when you're added to the body, then you're saved, because Jesus is the Savior of the body. If you're not added to the body through the baptism, well, you're not saved. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. He's Lord of those, and, and this is the thing, people claim you could be saved without the one baptism. One Lord, one faith, but where's the one baptism? That means you not only have a different Lord, you have a different faith. You don't have the one Lord, one faith, because the one Lord of the Bible says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, okay. Let me, let me remind you that there is only one baptism still in effect for us today, as seen, as in, as seen in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. While going through these six baptisms, it's easy enough for a second grader to understand that any one of these baptisms plus another baptism equals two baptisms. This is most definitely one baptism too many. So the first baptism I'm going to be going over, which the New Testament speaks of, the baptism of Moses. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Uh, Moreover, brethren, Paul's writing, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now we know that we are not the Jewish fathers who left the land of Egypt, walked through the sea with Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We're not saved by the baptism of Moses. We weren't there. And he says right here, who was it baptized into Moses? He said that all our fathers, he's speaking of Moses and the people who were with him. Uh, number two, the baptism of suffering. This is a reference to the pain Christ would endure on the cross. In Matthew 20, verse 22, Jesus answered and said, 
You know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. The baptism right there, baptism, all baptism means is immersed. So Jesus was going to be immersed in suffering. It's called the baptism of suffering. We do not endure through the battle. Some Christians might, but we do not all endure through the baptism of suffering in order to be saved. Other that would mean we have to die to be saved. I mean, the Bible does teach that, but it says, uh, it, or going later, it shows where we die with Christ. Um, okay, so we know it's not the baptism of Moses. We know it's not the baptism of suffering. That's two out of six down, which it can't be. Number three, the baptism of John. Now, notice the baptism of John was only for Jews, and it was not in the name of Jesus. If we read Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And this is the thing. Under the baptism of John, individuals went out there and confessed their sins. But what do we confess before we're baptized today? Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch, he preached to him Jesus. He said, here's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? And he goes to say, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you may. And he, he confessed with his mouth. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The confession they made to John was they confessed their sins before they, they were baptized. But today, when a sinner repents of his sins and is baptized for the remission of his sins, what he confesses is not his sins, but he confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we have an example of that. Under the Christian dispensation, Paul came across some in Ephesus, disciples of John, and upon hearing that they were only baptized with the baptism of John, he immersed them in water again, but in Jesus' name. So we come across that... In Acts chapter 19, um, Paul comes to Ephesus and he comes across some disciples um, and they're only baptized with the baptism of John. And we'll read right here, verse 1 through 5. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, what happened? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we know the baptism of John is not relevant today because there's individuals right here who needed to get immersed in water again, but this time in Jesus' name. John's baptism didn't give individuals the Holy Spirit, so now that Jesus died, he resurrected, ascended to heaven, they got to get baptized to Acts 2.38, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, number four, the baptism of fire. Now, verse 11 um, talks about fire, but looking at verse 10 and 12, we'll understand what this fire is, which he's speaking of in verse 11. This is John the Baptist speaking, and now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The baptism, the immersion in fire, is speaking of hell fire. And that's clearly seen, Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into where? The lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is the thing. No one wants to be baptized with the baptism of fire unless you want to be immersed in flame, everlasting fire. That's not what I want. So we know out of the six baptisms we're going over, the first four, baptism of Moses, that's not the one baptism which the Bible speaks of that Christians must have today. The baptism of suffering, that's not the baptism. The baptism of John, that's not the baptism. The baptism of fire, that's not the baptism. Now, we only have two baptisms left. And the thing is, the Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So it cannot be both. Because is that not two baptisms? Okay, so number five, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And notice this was a promise and not a command. 
Holy Spirit baptism prior to salvation only occurred twice and it was never to save an individual, but what it was for was to show that salvation was made available to the individual. For example, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the apostles were baptized with the Holy Ghost to show that salvation had been made available to the Jews. And then it happened again 10 years later to the Gentile, Cornelius and his household, to show that now salvation is made available for the Gentiles. Acts chapter 2, it happened once prior to salvation to show the Jews could be saved. Acts chapter 10, it happens again 10 years later. Never have no evidence of it happening before in between. Um... And it happens to the Jews, or to the Gentiles rather, to show the Jews that now Gentiles can be saved. Because for 10 years, Gentiles couldn't be saved. Only Jews. So we have to look at what was the purpose then of the Holy Spirit baptism prior to salvation. Um, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. So Acts chapter 1 verse 26, uh, going through Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4. And they gave their lots and their lot fell upon Matthias. So you know, Judas was part of the 12. He committed suicide. He hung himself. Um, so they needed to replace him. So they cast lots. Matthias took his place to be the 12th apostle. And they gave their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So now Matthias makes up the 12th apostle. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered in one place, just as Jesus told his apostles, said to wait, because the promise of the Father will be sent upon you. Uh, but they needed to wait in Jerusalem until that day happened, and that's what we find them doing. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So notice, this is the first instance of when the Holy Spirit baptism occurred on the day of Pentecost. Um, and it was to enable them to preach the gospel, to prove to the Jews that Jesus is actually the Lord. Because the Jews didn't believe it. But as soon as they seen these miracles, what's going on? You know, what's happening? How is it that we can hear these guys speaking in our own language? You know, and it was to prove that it was a miracle to prove to them that Jesus actually is Lord. So that was the purpose of the first one. Not to save them, but to show them that salvation today is made available. Um, and then it happens again in Acts chapter 10. This is 10 years later. Um, and it, now we see it happening to the Gentiles to prove to the Jews that Gentiles can now be saved. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the, the circumcision which believed and were astonished. Uh, so the circumcision, I was talking about the Jews, and they of the Jews which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, get this, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues, which is languages, and magnify God. They heard it, understood it. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid them water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them, Get this, to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we have individuals who are baptized with the Holy Ghost, and they still need to get water baptized. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit baptism was never to save anybody, but it was to show, it only happened twice prior to salvation, it was to show the Jews that salvation was made available, Jesus is Lord, and it happened again in Acts 10 to show the Jews that the Gentiles could be saved. Now get this, I, under, I highlighted it in uh, green. It says, they have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Well, when... Um, Peter is recapping these events in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 is a recap of Acts chapter 10. He says this, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, get this, as on us at the beginning. So he's saying, look, now they're baptizing the Holy Ghost. That happened to us when? At the beginning. Referring back to Acts chapter 2. It only happened twice. There's no evidence of it happening in between. He said at the beginning. When was the beginning? Well, when the church was established. All the New Testament is called the seed promise, and it's looking forward. It's looking forward. Uh, and then once the church is established, now it's looking backwards at the beginning. So the church is the kingdom of God, and the, the scripture points to it. So get this, the Holy Spirit baptism in Acts 2 and Acts 10 fulfilled the prophecy of Joel. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, 
Um, Acts 2.17 just repeats Joel 2.28, uh, that the Holy Ghost would be poured out upon all flesh. And what all flesh means is Jew and Gentile, either in the Jewish age or either Jew or Gentile. Now, in the Old Covenant, God already, uh, he prophesied through his prophet Joel that he would pour out his spirit not only on Jews, but Gentiles. And we see that fulfilled. Acts chapter 2, Gentiles or Jews received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 10, Gentiles received the Holy Ghost. So we see this prophecy fulfilled in Acts chapter 10. Um, it took the Holy Spirit to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah on the day of Pentecost. And it took the Holy Spirit to prove to the Jews that the Gentiles couldn't be accepted. That was the purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism prior to salvation. Now get this. The only other times than this, which the Holy Spirit was given with miraculous gifts, was through the laying on of the hands by the apostles. And we see that. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 18, Simon saw this. And when Simon saw, get this, that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Only the apostles could give the gift of the Holy Spirit. To, uh, so the Holy Spirit baptism occurred twice before salvation, never to save an individual. The only other times uh, besides that that an individual could receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit was through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. And there's many verses that back that up, and I'll go through them. Um, this is why Peter and John were sent to the Christians in Samaria. Peter and John were apostles. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Well, why did they send to them Peter and John? Why did they send them apostles? Who when they were come down prayed for them, get this, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So they called the apostles because they needed the miraculous gifts of the Holy Ghost. Um... Compare also with Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And when Paul, who was also an apostle, had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So get this, if only the apostles could lay their hands on somebody and give them the gifts of the Holy Spirit, are there any apostles alive today? No. Well, then how do we have individuals claiming to have gifts of the Holy Spirit? Right? And this is the thing. Simon saw it. Simon said, give me this power that whomsoever I lay my hands on can receive the gift of the Spirit. So only the apostles could and whoever they laid their hands on, say, say the apostle Paul laid his hands on me, gave me the gift of the Spirit. I couldn't lay my hands on anyone else. Why? Because that was the power of the apostles. That's what Simon saw. Simon said, give me this power that whomsoever I lay my hands on, I may give them the gift of the Spirit. And you know what? He wasn't able to because he didn't have that authority from God. Only the apostles did. So we understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred twice, not to save anybody prior to salvation, but to show them salvation was available. Um, and then after that, it had to be by the laying on of the hands of the apostles. No apostles here today. And this is the thing. If Holy Spirit baptism is relevant to today, well, don't be water baptized. Isn't that two baptisms? The Bible says one word, one faith, one baptism. So why are we practicing one more than the scripture says we actually need? Um, so number six, the baptism of water by the authority of Jesus. And what this means is in the name of Jesus. When somebody says stop in the name of the law, what they're saying is stop by the authority of the law. So Jesus uh, commanded baptism, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus came, this is after he died, buried, and resurrected. He's about to ascend to the Father. Jesus came and spoke to his uh, disciples, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We see that baptism was commanded by Jesus, and now it's also commanded by Peter. Get this, Acts 10, verse 47 and 48. Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So we see not only did Jesus command it, but Peter, being an apostle, knowing that the Lord commanded it, he commands it as well. We see that the baptism is also obeyed by sinners. Acts chapter 8, verse 35 through 38. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and get this, preached unto him Jesus. 
And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, and what doth hinder me to get baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I love this verse because, get this, Philip and the eunuch, Philip preaches the gospel to the eunuch. He says he preached to him Jesus, and in response to being preached Jesus, the eunuch says, here is water. You know, so it goes to show we can't preach Jesus without the water. Otherwise, we're preaching something different than they did. So Acts chapter 10, verse 47 and 48 at the bottom. Uh, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we see that the baptism, even after folks were baptized with the Holy Spirit in uh, Acts chapter 10, it wasn't to save them because they still needed to get water baptized. All right. Last page. So this is the only baptism still in effect today, as I see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We went through six. It can't be two of them, can't be three of them, can't be all six of them. Why? Because it says right here, does it not? One baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 8 says this. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So this is the thing. Can we believe that we will live with Christ if we don't die with him? No. And this is the thing. Well, where do we die with him? Well, let's bump up a few verses because that's verse eight. Go to verse three through five. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, get this, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Mark 16, 16, Jesus says this, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus, being the eternal author of salvation, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, this is what the author of salvation says. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. Now this is the thing, the end of the verse says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we understand, oh, it doesn't say he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned. But this is the thing, Jesus already said, belief Baptism, salvation. So why would you get baptized if you don't believe? Even if you get baptized if you don't believe, you're still not saved because Jesus said belief plus baptism equals salvation. I mean, it's like this. One plus two equals three. One does not equal three. Two does not equal three. You got to have them both. Jesus said that, the author of salvation. And today, this is what I'm calling for. All religious folk, uh, anyone I talk to walking around, they consider themselves religious, even atheists. I say, y'all celebrate the new year? Yeah. Oh, you're a lot more religious than you think. Because what year is it about to be? 2019. 2019 years since what? Since Jesus. They're celebrating. They're a lot more religious than they think. Um, okay. And then all religious folk to ask themselves, what church am I a member of? Who built the church that I am a member of? When was it established and where was it established? Can I even find the name of the church I attend in the Bible? Because if we go by the Bible only, well, how do we get a church that's not in the Bible? As seen and stated, the New Testament only confirms one church established by Jesus. He's the head of the body, one head, one church. You can't have Christ without the church. Otherwise, you're going to sever the head from the body. We all know the capitation kills somebody. You can't have Christ without being in the church. Um, and Jesus said, OK, confirms one church established by Jesus. Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church in the singular. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it in the singular. Any individual not a member of this church will not and cannot be saved. Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. So if you're not part of that body, you can't be saved. That's according to God. On the day of judgment, when we're going to compare ourselves uh, according to the scripture and be judged, if we're not a member of this body, we're not going to be saved. God already pre-warns us. Uh, I said it before and I say it again. Any individual not a member of this church will not and cannot be saved. Ephesians 5.23. Uh, and this is the thing. Many today are proud of denominations as if the Lord approves them, not understanding that God actually forbids them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 
Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and get this, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And this is the thing, uh, no pen. So division, y'all familiar with math? You got the line, the numerator, the denominator. Without the denominator, there would be no division. A denomination is a denominator which causes the division. The scripture says, let there be no division, let there be no denominations among you. Does it not? And this is the thing, Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, mark them which cause denominations and offenses contrary to the doctrine in which you have learned, and get this, and avoid them. So what are we doing joining denominations? What does God say to do? Avoid them. Again, my name is Jacob Thorne. I just got to just get started. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm done, okay? I've listened to you long enough, and here it is. You've been marked, mm -hmm. okay? I know that you've been calling myself, Michael Jacobson, and Mark Hick heretics, and that we're sending people to hell. You've been marked in this community, bro. You were preaching a gospel that is contrary to what we've been taught, that Christ is enough, that That's there is right. no act of man upon our salvation. You've been marked. Right. You're done here. I'm asking you to just go ahead and get your stuff and walk out this door because you are preaching a gospel that is contrary to this house, and it's time for you to go. Amen. Yes. You're done. Is that how you all feel? Yes. Okay. Well, could I ask you how The brother of this house is a brother of mine, and I am standing in his behalf. Oh, right now. I'm asking you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. And take well, yours to I hope you know I got this on video. John Paul Mitchell Thank kicking you. me out. We got everybody in here. That's good. That's good. <laughs> hey, did I give anything? Did I say? Hey, hey what? You didn't have the right to record, record me. me. That's against the law, brother. That ain't You have no the right law. to record me or post it. But get out. Yeah, there you go. It is against All right. The law. Did he tell you he recorded this? No. Yeah, I, he baited you, brother. He I recorded myself. He I recorded all myself. You're done. Did I Give not? Give you a chance. I can you record. go and bashing brothers and bashing yeah. what we believe. You, you are, are not churches. doing the work of Christ. Right. Hey. It's Jacob, time for you to go. Hey. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's trying to assault me, I got this for my protection. If you're a godly man, then a godly walk out the door, please. What protection? You do not have the right to record me without hey. my knowledge, and you did exactly that. All right, y'all. You can yeah. record me. Make sure you post it. Hey, I'm posting this. Make sure you post hey, it. Hey, one and two. I hope. Good. Where's Goodbye. my Bible? It's right there. Right there. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Day. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hey. All I had was book, chapter, and verse for everybody. Hey, he, you see him try swinging at me? Open door church, no longer welcome here. Hey, wow, may God be glorified though. You know, all I did went in there, book, chapter, and verse for everything. And they kicked me out. They said I've been marked. Man, denomination is, denominationalism at its finest. Yo, praise God.